So this is Lesson from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number 12 in that series. And uh, we're studying the, the, uh, the life and times of Hezekiah. This is the third uh, lesson that we've focused on King Hezekiah. And if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, 2 Kings chapter 20. Uh, we'll be looking at 2 Kings chapter 20 today. Um, we've, uh, as I said, we've uh, looked at the life of uh, King Hezekiah as described in several Old Testament passages, mentioned last time that uh, uh, various individuals write about uh, Hezekiah in the Old Testament. Uh, of course, these do not recount everything that happened but um, they do describe three of the most significant times in Hezekiah's life that we talked about. Uh, first is the Great Reformation uh, when he took over, when he became king at 25 years of age. He began one of the most uh, ambitious, and reli uh, ambitious religious and social reform programs in Jewish history. One of the reasons why uh, writers call him you know, uh, the, the greatest king uh, during the divided kingdom uh, period. Um, and because of these spiritual and moral and social reforms, the nation itself prospered uh, economically and certainly they prospered spiritually as well. Then uh, there's the story of his rescue um, and this uh, deals with his response to uh, Assyria the world power at the time that was uh, situated to the north of his, uh, of his country, of Judea. Uh, and that was what we looked at last week, what took place when the Assyrians laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And if you remember correctly, uh, Hezekiah refused to surrender and instead, as he was counseled to do by the prophet Isaiah, he put his trust in God to save the nation. And we read that he did. God did save them by sending an angel to destroy 185,000 Assyrian uh, soldiers. Um, eventually, the Assyrian king returned home and was also killed, thus putting an end to the constant threat of their neighbor to the north. Now, the interesting thing about this particular episode is not the fact that Hezekiah resisted the Assyrians. Uh, that he resisted was not what saved him and saved the nation. As a matter of fact, you know, that he resisted is what caused the trouble. So long he was, as he was paying tribute, there was no trouble, but then he decided, we're not paying tribute anymore, we're not going to be under the thumb of Assyria, and, you know, and so he resisted that, and um, uh, for his effort, the Assyrian army came and laid siege to the country. And remember, I told you last week, he, he paid a tremendous tribute to the uh, king uh, to, uh, you know, to back away and to, uh, to allow them to uh, continue on. And uh, the king of Assyria received the tribute money, you know, the gold and the silver from the temple, so on and so forth, and changed his mind and laid siege to the, to the city uh, anyways. No, what saved um, um, Hezekiah in the city was that he sought the will of the Lord in what to do in that particular matter. And he obeyed God. So years later, when the Babylonians this time were threatening Judah, uh, because the Babylonians you know, took over uh, from the Assyrians, they defeated the Assyrians, they were the ascending power at the time. So years later, when they, the Babylonians, were threatening Judah, the prophet Jeremiah, not Isaiah, but Jeremiah this time, was telling the, the nation of, uh, of Judah to, um, to surrender and to submit to this foreign nation. The point I'm making is during Hezekiah's time, Isaiah was telling them, look, uh, don't surrender, resist, you know, God will save you. And then in the time um, of Jeremiah, uh, when the Babylonians were attacking the city, uh, the, Jeremiah the prophet was saying to the king and the people, okay, this time don't resist give in, go with the king. Don't allow them to come in and destroy the city, just surrender. So you know, the point I'm making is that God's point is not always you know, to resist, to resist. Sometimes they had to resist and sometimes they had to give in. The important thing was, were they listening to uh, the word of God? Were they listening to what God was telling them to do in a particular uh, situation? 
Now we know that in the case of Jeremiah, the people were stubborn and they didn't listen and they tried to do uh, what Hezekiah did. You know, they're, they're, this is years later and they're saying, well, wait a minute, Hezekiah, he resisted the Assyrian army and look what happened, God saved them. And so now in the time of Jeremiah, the people were saying, well, that's, let's just do what they did, let's resist. But the prophet Jeremiah was saying, no, 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 this time God wants you to surrender. Well, they disobeyed and they decided to hold out. And of course, they failed. The king came in and destroyed them all. The Babylonians came in, destroyed them all and took them off into captivity. So the result, as I say, was that the city in the time of Jeremiah was destroyed. Many were killed. They were taken into captivities anyways. And so the difference was not whether they resisted or not, as I said before. The difference was whether they sought the Lord and followed His instructions or not. Because our response to crisis is not always the same. You know, our response to crisis ought to be what we believe the Lord is leading us to do. That was the lesson there. So Hezekiah succeeded because when he saw his uh, predicament, he went immediately to the Lord in prayer to seek his help and counsel. And through the prophet Isaiah, God told him to resist, that this was God's plan for this time. And if he followed it, he would succeed. You see, it's not the plan that we choose, it's if we seek God's will and follow it, that's what counts. So some will say, well, it was easy for Hezekiah because he had Isaiah to actually go into his, you know, to his room and face him one-on-one -on -one and tell him what, what to do. You know, Isaiah was there in person saying, this is what God wants you to do, it was easy. And of course, that's true in a sense. Hezekiah did have a human being right in front of him, sent by God to tell him what to do. But you know what? A lot of kings and leaders didn't listen to the prophets that God sent. And they did their own thing even after the prophets spoke. I mean, you know, just Saul, the very first king, right? He had a prophet, Samuel. He believed Samuel when Samuel said, you're going to be the king, I'm anointing you the king. This is what God wants. Saul believed him and he became king. And yet when Samuel said, look, wait, wait for me before you offer the sacrifice, before you go into battle, wait for me. And Saul didn't take him seriously, he didn't wait. He offered the sacrifice anyways. That and other types of disobedience led to him losing the kingdom. The point being, he didn't listen to God's instruction, even if that instruction came to him through a human being. So today we can, we, we can still go to God in prayer to ask for direction and He still answers us, but He answers us in a variety of ways. For example, He answers us through His, his word. The problem there is, well, if we read it, if we know it, it'll provide the answer and the direction that we should take. You know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, right? Every you know, scripture is inspired or is breathed, God breathed, and profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correct. Reproof, you know, I like to think that that term reproof means quality control. You, know, you take your plan and you hold it up to God's word and see quality control. Are the specs there? You know, does your plan, does your idea, you know, does it, will it hold up to reproof, to, to, a, to an examination by God's word for reproof, for correction? When we're wrong, you know, the, the Bible is able to give us direction. It trains us in righteousness, the Bible says, or Paul says. Why? So that we can be complete, we can be ready to be servants of God. So God you know, he speaks to us through His Word. He directs us in that way. And I think, I think we know that. I'm not, I'm not teaching something radically new here. We, we understand that. The point I'm emphasizing, of course, is if we read it, what's the point of you know, daily Bible reading? What's the point of that? 
Unfortunately, a lot of people think you know, daily Bible reading, the point of it is so that we can say, hey, I read through the Bible in a year. <laughs> Every day I read my three and a half chapters or whatever. Oh man, it's 365 days I read the entire Bible. Yeah, you know, that's not the point of it. The point of it is that if you read it every day, you're feeding on some spiritual food that hopefully will you know, serve you in some way. It's not important whether you read it in a year or two years. I, I tell people, don't put that kind of pressure on yourself. Because if you say, oh man, I got to read four chapters every day. Whoops, oh it's Christmas, we got company, blah, blah, blah. Things are happening on the plane, I forgot my Bible. Oh, I'm gone for three days, I come back, wow, I'm 16 chapters behind. So what do I do? I stay up till 2 a.m., you know, I got to catch up. <laughs> what is that? You know, that's, that's nonsense, it's not the way to read God's word. It's not a competition. You know, if you miss a meal, do you eat two meals to replace that one? You, you know what I'm saying? So reading God's word is simply staying in contact with Him. Some people say, well, what possible you know, connection could I have uh, if I'm reading the minutia of the construction of the tabernacle in the Old Testament? What possible relevancy can that have in my life because I'm working at Tinker or wherever you know, and I'm having issues with my supervisor. What possible connection can that have that they had 16 poles this way and the, the loops were made of gold and they had goat, you know, they had goat skins on top of that. What, what does that have to do with my life? Well, nothing actually. <laughs> nothing. Uh, what's important is that you took the time to sit down and to get into God's word in order to commune with the Lord, to allow Him to speak to you in some way, whether you're in the book of Numbers or in the book of Revelation. You're taking the time to commune with God and He sees that, He knows that, so that He can give you the answer, He can direct your mind, He can incline your heart at those moments when you call out to him. That's my, that's my point. You have a friend, you never talk to your friend, you never call your friend, you never write your friend, you never send your friend a birthday card, you never call, you, know, you never text him or her, you know, never. And then all of a sudden you need your friend. And you, you, you call because you need your friend and realize uh, there is no service at this number. <laughs> Your friend changed phones. Your friend changed the emails. You can't get in touch. Why? Well, you lost touch. It's the same thing with God. We never talk to Him or you know, we're not in the habit of you know, communing daily with Him. Then all of a sudden we, we need to talk to Him. He needs to, we need to hear His voice. You know? And it's like, whoop, no service at this number. You know, the, the communication is not clear and open. And so God answers us in many ways, in one way, of course, through His word, but also through His church. Paul says, and He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. The leaders and the teachers in the church, they can be counselors to help find solutions, to help find directions, to help bear burdens. How many times have I had people you know, call me or come see me and so on and so forth and they just shared something and, and in their conversation with me they say, I, I'm not asking you to find the solution for me. I just wanted to talk. I, I just wanted to unburden myself so that someone else is aware of what I'm going through. I don't know what the solution is and I'm certainly not asking you to come up with a magical solution for me. I just wanted to share. In other words, I just needed somebody to bear this burden with me for a time to help me. And so sometimes you know, God speaks to us through the church and it's not necessarily you know, a quote minister or a, an elder, sometimes just our brother in the Lord or our sister in the Lord. And sometimes it's easier to share that burden, especially if that burden is sinful, a sinful burden that we have for whatever reason. 
Sometimes it's just easier to share that with a brother or sister that we know, that we have a relationship with. Well, that member of the church, you know, God can minister to us through that member of the church. That's why we're here, to minister to each other. That's why the, the service on Sunday is a type of ministry. It's the ministry of the word being preached and taught. It's the ministry of the communion being shared as a reminder. But if that's the only ministry that we receive, that's not enough. We, we need to receive the ministry of fellowship when we share with one another and talk with each other, not only just problems, but hopes and dreams and service for the church and you know, raising kids, you know, uh, wow. What a job that is to raise children. Isn't it great when you get together with a Christian sister or brother and you share your common experience in raising children? Sometimes you don't find the complete answer, but it sure is good to know you're not the only one that's yelling and screaming at your kids. You know, <laughs> oh, you yell too? You lose your temper too? Whew, I thought I was the only one. They make you crazy? Oh, I, I thought I was the only one going crazy with four teenagers. You know. So God answers us sometimes through the church. And then of course, through His Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're kind of afraid of this idea because we don't want to be too, quote, charismatic. But Paul says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We're being led by the Spirit. The Spirit that convicts our hearts and moves us to search and do what is right before God. Who is it that prompts you to do what is difficult spiritually? The devil? Well, of course not. Your flesh? Well, of course not. So that only leaves the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that moves us to do what is right in a difficult situation. It's the Spirit of God that moves us to go a second mile. It's the Spirit of God that, that tells us that where we're going and what we're doing, this is going to be dangerous spiritually. It's just not quite the right thing because that's not our flesh. Our flesh is going to say, come on, help yourself. You only live once. Why not? That's your flesh talking. The Holy Spirit never said to you, why not? <laughs> As an answer. The Holy Spirit will say to you why, or why you shouldn't, but it'll never say to you why not as a way of allowing you to do something. Because the Spirit of God knows why you should do something or why you shouldn't do something. And if you listen carefully, you'll be able to discern. So God speaks to us through His, through His Spirit. And if you wonder, how does, he, how does the Spirit work within me? Read Romans chapter eight carefully and you'll see. Not the subject of our lesson today, however, but read Romans 8. Anyways, like Hezekiah, we can succeed in facing our greatest trials and challenges not by figuring out the best plan of attack or best plan of escape or devising coping strategies. We succeed when we go to God first in prayer and we ask for His direction. We ask for His solution to our problem to our dilemma. Okay, so our final episode here with Hezekiah's life involves one more example of Hezekiah, again, going to God in need, this time for a very personal matter. Uh, this is spoken about, uh, I'm talking about Hezekiah's illness, spoken about in three places, 2 Kings 20, 2 Chronicles 32, and 1 Samuel 38, but I'm going to read out of 2 Kings 20. Uh, the author here simply states that Hezekiah became mortally ill, and at this time he's about 39 or 40 years of age. The balance of the information about Hezekiah tells of how he prayed to God to be healed, and after he was healed, the foolish way that he acted with foreign envoys that had come from Babylon. So let's read, beginning in chapter 20, verse 1. It says, in those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. So he was ill, but there was a question as to how serious it was, and so he went to the Lord, 
and the Lord answered him, not in a dream or anything, because you know, in a dream about your own health, you wonder how accurate that can be. So the Lord sends Isaiah the prophet, the recognized prophet, and Isaiah announces that yes, your illness is terminal. So we read two and three, it says, then he turned, he meaning Hezekiah, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And so we see a familiar response from Hezekiah and his immediate turning to God for help. Uh, I want you to note that he's grieving his imminent death and his prayer is typical of one who is kind of bargaining with God, you know, the, the steps there, the grieving process, you know, denial, bargaining, anger, depression. You know. Well, we see it right here, he's bargaining with God. Perhaps Isaiah's announcement brought him out of the denial stage. You know, he may have been in denial about this illness. That, oh, I'll be okay, I'm planning for the future. And Isaiah goes and tells him, no, 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 don't plan for the future, you're going to die. And he says to him, set your house in order, meaning succession and all the, the things that he needed to do as a national leader. So in the prayer, he's telling God that he doesn't deserve this and that he's been good and he's done his best. That's bargaining. God, why are you doing this to me? I've been good, I did what you wanted me to do, this is what you do to me, you know, it's bargaining. People do that when they have a terminal illness. Lord, please, let me just live till you know, my daughter's wedding and then it's okay after that. You, know, you bargain with God. So let's read verses uh, four to seven. Then before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, take a cake of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. So at exactly that moment that Hezekiah was praying, the Lord spoke to Isaiah and gave him a message for the king. Um, it's the true God. Now when Isaiah comes and tells him this is the message of the Lord, uh, Isaiah is saying, hey, this is the true God speaking to you, you know, the God of, the God of, of David and, and the fathers. And this is the one who's speaking to you concerning this matter. And God has heard the request and God has been moved by your grief and your tears, not by your argument. Notice, it isn't your argument. Look, what have I done? I've been good, I've tried to do my best, blah, 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 blah. You know, justification arguments, you know, I'm a good person. Why should I die so young? You know? It's not the argument that moved God, it's the tears. We don't appeal to God with logic or arguments. The best appeal to God is a broken heart, a humble spirit. God, this moves God. Your logic, my logic, our arguments, not so much. And so God makes a promise to Hezekiah. First, he will be well enough to go to the temple in three days. So obviously the boil, the illness that he had, made him unclean. Couldn't, couldn't, you know, couldn't go to worship, couldn't go to the temple. So in three days it'll be healed, he'll be well enough to go and give thanks, maybe even make a, th a thank offering, if you wish. Uh, then he'll add 15 years to his, to his life, which was pretty good. If he's around 40, 50, another 15 years, you know, and in, in, in that time, you know, 30, 40, 45, that was kind of the, you know, that was the average life. Uh, life was short in those days, short and brutal. Um, also, he says he will save the city from the Assyrians. So we find out from this episode you know, that things were really bad for Hezekiah. The Assyrians were attacking. He was trying to kind of you know, get the city prepared for the siege and all that, and at the same time he had this illness. So he was having, you know, when God said set your things in order, there was more than just the succession right, also the Assyrians. He had to you know, prepare the city for an attack that he might not live long enough to, you know, to be there for. 
And so he said, he said the first promise, I'm going to save the city from the Assyrians. And also that he'll continue to protect Jerusalem, meaning you know those 15 years, you're going to have peace. I'll, I'll be protecting you. So these promises reveal that, as I say, the illness took place during the episode with the Assyrians, but was explained later on in the book of Kings. So the writer explains that Hezekiah suffered from an infected boil of some kind and fig cakes. Um, historically, we know that these things were often used to draw, some, to draw infection. You know, people still use that, homemade uh, remedies nowadays. They, they put a certain mixture of things to, to kind of draw out the, uh, the poison, if you wish, and this is what was used to treat it. So God provides the manner of healing, and more importantly, the promise that it would work. So we pray for operations and procedures, please God, direct the hands of the doctor, so on and so forth. They have, we have the treatments, the doctors treat us, we take the pills and all that, but God is the one that provides the results. Why is it that some people, you know, they have a, a, a cancer surgery and then they're cancer free, you know, and, and they're good for another 20 years. And other people, they, they have the same cancer surgery and it comes back and it takes their lives within six months. Who knows why? Same treatment, same pills, roughly the same, and yet it works with one, doesn't work with the, with the other people. Verses eight to 11, now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Isaiah said, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward uh, uh, 10 steps or go back 10 steps? So Hezekiah answered, it is easy for the shadow to decline 10 steps, but no, let the shadow turn backwards 10 steps. Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord and he brought the shadow on the stairway back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So Isaiah cannot simply wait the three days for his healing to take place. He wants a sign right away. If I was God, my first thought would be, what an ingrate. <laughs> I'm healing this guy. I'm telling him I'm going to save him. I'm telling him I'm going to, I'm giving him 15 more years. He's still not happy, he wants a sign. But the Lord obliges him by telling him to choose what sign he would like to see, the shadow move forward or the shadow move backward. And so unlike Joshua, you know, Joshua had a sign, you know, the sun, it stood still as a sign, it stood still in the sky as a sign to all the people, this sign uh, was not like that. This sign was a private matter and only for one person, for Hezekiah. So he chooses that uh, what was presently in the shadow be illuminated on the steps of the palace. This also signified that extra time was uh, given to him. In other words, you know, the shadow the shadow's going forward and uh, you know, Isaiah said, what, what do you like? You want, you want the shadow to go forward or backwards? So he said, no, I want the shadow to go backwards. So that means the shadow, go, you know, a shadow always goes forwards, right? The sun, he, he wanted the shadow to go backwards. And so it's like God is turning back the clock for him, giving him uh, extra time. Now in Isaiah 38, 9 to 20, we're not going to read that, but Isaiah records a prayer written by Hezekiah where he praises and thanks God for his healing and extended life. And in this prayer or poem or song, uh, Isaiah grieves over the sudden end of his life. Interesting that he equates dying with not seeing God anymore. Uh, very interesting because it was with David that the thought of life after death and a continuing relationship with God was fully expressed in writing. Um, uh, 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 continuing revelation. You know, people in the Old Testament didn't know everything that we know. You know God revealed things you know, uh, gradually, gradual re uh, uh, revelation. Um, Hezekiah did not have the spiritual insights that David had. David understood that life, conscious life, was possible and would continue after death. Hezekiah, he says to God, uh, you know, if I die, then I won't see you anymore. 
and nobody will be there to praise you anymore, you know, with the thought, he, he didn't have the thought of a conscious life after death. Well, during those times it was rare, the prophets, the individuals that had that kind of, that kind of insight. And so he, he, Hezekiah, he pleads to live since this was the only way he could please and praise God since after death there would only be silence. Again, in Hezekiah's mind, no concept like Paul the Apostle, for example, that death brought you into God's presence. When Paul the Apostle talks about death, right, he says, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'm free from this body of sin, finally, I'm with the Lord. You know, we, where do we learn about life after death, you and me? Well, we don't learn it from National Geographic or Forbes magazine, or Time, or the newspaper, where do we learn about life after death? Well, we learn it from the Bible, from the one who resurrected from the dead, from the one who was uh, at the throne of God, from the one who came from God. We learn it from Jesus, what life after death is like, that there is such a thing. So we have a, a very developed concept of life after death, but Hezekiah did not have that developed concept because, well, these things were not revealed to him. As far as he was concerned, once he died, that was it. So we read in verses 12 to 15, at that time, uh, Berodak uh, Baladan, a son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. So after his recovery, after the city was saved from the Assyrians, Babylonian envoys were sent to visit him and to bring him a gift. Now the Babylonians were a rising power at the time. They were not yet as strong as the Assyrians, but they were becoming more powerful. They were scouting the area for potential allies or for future conquests. Hezekiah had prospered with his reforms and he was showing off the wealth of the nation in an attempt to build political friendship with these people, with the Babylonians. He figures, boy, the Assyrians are to the north, they're always some sort of threat to me. Whoops, there's this rising power even further north. Maybe if I have an alliance with these guys, you know, it'll be a good thing. Remember now, God had always said, don't make alliances, I'm your protector. Okay. So um, Hezekiah's been uh, prospering with his reforms. He was showing off his wealth, trying to build uh, a political friendship with these uh, people. So what happens? What are the mistakes that he made? Well, he quickly forgot that he had no need for political alliances with pagan nations. Are you kidding me? God had saved him from the Assyrians <laughs> just recently. God had saved his life just recently. God had given him 15 more years of life just recently. God had given him a personal miracle just recently. And so what does he do? He just goes back to his old ways. He didn't realize that he was setting himself up for future attack. He may have been overconfident because God had promised him 15 years of life and protection of the city. Of course, this was always contingent on Hezekiah's continued trust and obedience. So he recounts to Isaiah what he did with the envoys. So let's see what Isaiah says. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, um, uh, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, 
the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, is it not so, if there will be peace and truth in my days? So Isaiah predicts what the Babylonians are going to do to the southern kingdom in about a century. If you're wondering you know, where the Bible, you know, we say, well, the Bible is filled with prophecy, fulfilled prophecy. Okay? And that's why we believe it, it's the word of God, because nothing else explains fulfilled prophecy. Well, here is an example of fulfilled prophecy. We know when Isaiah lived. We know it historically. And we know when the Babylonians rose to power. We know that historically. And we know what took place with Babylon. We know that historically. So here you have Isaiah one century before it took place predicting what will happen. He prophesies or predicts the utter destruction of Jerusalem and Judea. He predicts the exile. He predicts even the rule of David, uh, uh, of, uh, the role rather, of Daniel and the three young nobles from Jerusalem who were royal descendants of Hezekiah. He even said, sons not yet born to you will be part of the royal house in Babylon. Well, who could that be? Well, uh, Daniel and his three uh, friends. So there's, a, there's an example of fulfilled prophecy. We see the prophecy being made here and we know when Isaiah lived. And then we see later on the fulfillment of that prophecy a hundred years later, historically, chronologically. See, that, that's why we believe this is a special book. No other book has that. The Koran, for example, it doesn't have any, it does not, no feature like this. So in Isaiah, it is after this event that Isaiah begins to prophesy and lament over the future sufferings of the people and the ultimate Savior that will come much later on. So for his part, for his part rather, Hezekiah has a rather short-term view of what Isaiah has just said. He believes and accepts it, but since it's in the future, he's relieved. He's even happy that he can look forward to 15 years of peace and, and, and prosperity. Isn't that human of him? <laughs> I, I mean, it's so human of him. Bad things are going to happen, you know, 100 years from now. And, uh, your people are going to suffer. Your kingdom's going to be destroyed. But in 100 years from now, whew, sure glad it's not in my time. I'm good. Lord gave me 15 years of good time, so I'm fine. Whatever. Let them deal with it in the future. You know, he probably thought that Babylon's becoming a great power was good since he wouldn't have to worry about Assyria anymore. But of course, we know that Babylon became Judah's worst nightmare and worst enemy later on. Finish up verse 20, uh, verse 20 and 21. Let's see, where are they? There it is. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, became king in his place. So here uh, the author summarizes and finalizes the rest of uh, Hezekiah's life, makes reference you know, to the building of the pool, you know, the, the water, the tunnel, talked about that last week. Uh, and we see here the relationship between these two books, how they correlate uh, one with another. You know, stories that give us insights into a man who did great things and from whom we can learn much, these stories that I've been telling you about. Hezekiah's experiences and reactions to things are really the teachers in these stories. For example, they teach us about being God's person and what it means to be God's person. I want you to remember one thing about Hezekiah. The Bible says he was the greatest, the greatest king of the divided kingdom. Okay? And what does that mean, that he was God's person? Well, it means that he was very human. I mean, look at what Hezekiah did, and it doesn't, doesn't it, does it show some kind of superhero to you? The person that is called the greatest of, the, of those kings, he doesn't look that super to me. What does it show? It shows somebody with a spotty record. Some great, some good, some bad, some stupid. 
You know, cutting off the Assyrians, that was a bad move. Getting rid of the idols, that was a good move. Obeying God in a crisis, that was a great move. Showing off his wealth, that was a stupid move. He did a bad job of raising his son, Manasseh, who uh, you know, reigned after him, and Manasseh went back to idolatry. So there's some good, some bad, some stupid, some great in his life. So being God's person doesn't mean being perfect. It means that we remain God's person despite our successes and despite our failures. Being God pers God's person also means that we are reliant on God. Hezekiah had a, an automatic reaction whenever something bad happened. He went straight to the temple to pray about it. His first response was always prayer and seeking God's will. And the times that he failed, we see it was because he failed to do this. The, the envoys from Babylon came and, and brought him gifts and so on and so forth. We don't see a prayer there where he's saying, Lord, give me wisdom here. What's going on? Are they here to spy me out? Well, you know, help me. He didn't do that. He just ran, whoa, hey, welcome. Big shots from the north. Come on, let me show you our stuff. Not all of God's people are kings. But if a king felt the need to rely on God, shouldn't the rest of us be prepared to go to God first when trouble comes? See my point here? So God's people are very human. They're reliant on God. And finally, God's person lives by grace and faith. Despite his mistakes, even compound mistakes, you know, showing off his stuff and then feeling glad that the punishment has only come after he dies to other people, God still blessed this very human, short-sighted guy. He lost as many as he won, but God blessed him anyways. It made no sense. It didn't add up. The blessings compared to the track record. It, did, you know, it didn't add up. Well, you know what? Grace does not add up. It isn't logical. It's not based on scores or what you deserve. As I've said so many times before, grace is getting what you don't deserve. And certainly Hezekiah, he didn't deserve what he got. The only reason Hezekiah survived the revolt of his own people when he tore down the altars. The only reason he survived the Assyrian army, he survived the terminal illness, he survived the dim diplomatic blunder, the only reason was because God decided to extend His grace to him. It's the only reason. Brothers and sisters, the only way we will ever survive our past mistakes, our present weaknesses, our future failures, is because as God's person in Jesus Christ, God has de decided to extend His, His grace to us. That's why. And this is the greatest lesson that we can learn from this king. And it's the most important lesson we can learn from the Bible as a whole. That despite our wins and our losses, despite our uh, failings, despite our sins, God continues to decide to just extend His grace to us. And if we are God's person, we live within the circle of that grace because of our faith in Jesus Christ and not because of the perfection of our, you know, of our attitude, not because we don't make mistakes. Okay, so that's a little bit of insight into the life and times of Hezekiah. Thank you very much for your attention.